Hello, welcome everyone to the event today. Um, on behalf of the Fellowship Beyond Numbers Organizing Committee, um, thank you all for coming and thank you to the two speakers who's graciously given us their time today and given us uh, their, uh, their insights. Um, vaccination is a very hot topic in this day and age, um, you know, at both an in individual and collective level. Um, people have been thinking about this. Um, uh, often from a numbers perspective, but is it ultimately a question about numbers? Um, should, uh, uh, should we think about something more about the heart of the issue? And to help us explore these ideas, uh, we have two panelists today that we'll be interviewing. Uh, first is Corinne Glasby, who as a Baptist care director is responsible for caring for one of the most vulnerable members of our society as they run multiple um, aged care facilities. Uh, she's also the EGM of product pricing and governance in IAG for direct insurance. So she's definitely someone who knows her numbers. Our second panelist is Sam Chan. Now, normally you can be a doctor by either getting a medical degree or by getting a PhD. Um, and um, Sam thought, why not both? So he's both a practicing doctor and a theologian with a PhD in theology. Um, and before we uh, dig in and start our interviews, can I just point everyone to the slider link that Martin has sent around? Um, yep, so Martin just sent that around. So at the end, there will be some time for Q&A. Um, please, uh, as questions come up in your mind, feel free to, uh, to type, it, type it out and send it to us. And we'll try to get to it um, with about 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, now, let's uh, we'll begin our interview with Corinne. Hi, Hi Corinne. Hello. So first, why don't you tell us about what you do both in your work at IEG and as a Baptist Care Director? So I, as you said, I'm looking after product pricing and governance uh, at in the direct insurance business at IAG now, um, but I've also spent a lot of time doing risk roles over the last few years and I'm an actuary by trade. So I've kind of looked across various aspects of insurance um, and even now I'm looking after the first line risk team within direct insurance. I'm also a director of Baptist Care. I'm the vice chairman actually of Baptist Care New South Wales ACT. Um, I've been, apart from one year off that I had uh, recently, I have been on the board since I think 2007. So it's um, been quite interesting living through the, the pandemic um, as a director. Why don't you tell us a bit more about that? What, what's it like in these aged care homes in the middle of a pandemic? What are the lessons and challenges so far? Yeah, it's, um, we probably were one of the first ones to learn some lessons because Baptist Care actually has um, Dorothy Henderson Lodge, which some of you might remember was the first aged care facility that actually uh, got hit by COVID. And we dealt with a lot of different gastro and flu outbreaks over the years and the processes are all in place for managing those sorts of events, but they're very different, as you can imagine. Um, what we found was we one of the things that we really had to do was work closely with the state and federal government and the health departments and we had a lot of support there because we were all learning about the disease and how to manage it at that point in time and some of the things that we found was just how important communication is and I think that's something we can probably all apply to every job that we do that if we communicate with our customers communicate with the families of our residents communicate with the government and communicate with our staff then everyone feels like um, much better about the whole situation. I have to say that the dedication of the staff on the ground was amazing. We had people just um, putting themselves into the situation, doing whatever they could to support. But it was also very difficult because what you find is suddenly all of the staff that you think that you've got working in that facility have to go into isolation. So you've suddenly got to find a whole new group of staff. And particularly at the beginning, that was quite scary for staff because they didn't actually know whether the the infection protocols we were putting in place were strong enough and they were worried about the impact for themselves and for their families. 
So that was um, quite difficult, but people, they, a lot of people who work in aged care, they just love what they do and they love the people that they're working with. And I think that put us in a really good position. But we also, everything was made more difficult. If you've got COVID in a home, everyone's having to put PPE equipment on every time they go into a room. And not only um, do they have to put it on once a day, they have to put it on every time they go into a different room. And this is our, our the people who are residents of these aged care homes, this is their home. And so they've got people coming, putting all this equipment on in order to come into their room to give them their meal or to check on them or to do anything like that. And you can imagine if some of those people have dementia, which a large number of people in aged care homes do, what do they think as this person's coming in with all this gear into their home? It's, it's just a very difficult situation. So we're trying to balance how we protect our staff and all the different residents through the infection protocols but still recognise that this is where they live, this is the home that they have, and how do we still give them that feeling of homeliness? So it's really difficult. The industry is also under pressure with funding, and you can imagine all this costs more money. Uh, we've got staff who often work across multiple homes, and we soon learnt that we can't have that happen, because if it goes into one home, then it will also go into another. So we now have to ask our staff if they will name who their main employer is, and then we have to make up if they're not getting, um, we have to consider the, the income that they're getting. So there's all sorts of complications there. But for the residents, it also increases the loneliness and the worry because they're already vulnerable people. They can't have their family visits. They can't have volunteers in. It's really hard to keep them occupied as well when our staff are having to do all this extra stuff. So we did things like bring in um, iPads so that they can talk to their families, which we hadn't done before. So we've had to innovate as well. Uh, so, you know, I think there's a lot of good things that have come out of um, COVID in terms of that innovation and, and looking at things differently in the way we, that we do it. And of course, the key thing we've had to do is think about vaccination of our staff and vaccination of our residents. And the government came and helped us with the resident, resident vaccinations, which was great. But it is something we have to continually look at because the turnover in these homes is quite regular. Um, people are quite unwell when they go into the home. So we get new people in quite regularly. So we need to make sure they're continually being vaccinated. And for staff, it's been harder as well, trying to get them um, on the list, get them done. And I don't know, you might've seen that in September, I think it is, all our staff have to be vaccinated. And that's really easy to do from the staff who are there now um, in terms of they now that know these rules. But as we employ new people into, into the homes, we need to make sure that all of them are vaccinated as well. So now we're asking our staff when they come in to have their normal flu vaccine, they have to have police checks, they have to potentially be um, registered for NDIS. And now we're also asking for the COVID vaccine. So we can see um, that it, given it's already hard to find enough staff to come in to our nursing homes and, and um, or aged care facilities, um, we can see that getting even harder with the extra expectations of our staff coming in. So we've learned a lot, I think, along the way. Hmm, right. Um, so for someone who does uh, so much work with the elderly care, what are your thoughts about the vaccine and all, all the controversies surrounding it recently? Yeah, it's been really interesting watching it, hasn't it? On it's, The newspapers are having fun putting lots of information out there, which I think has caused a lot of confusion personally. Um, I think it's our duty as a society to care for the people who are vulnerable. And so I think that means that we need to encourage or the government to make sure all these vulnerable people are um, vaccinated. And it's not just the elderly, it's actually also the homeless, the people that there's a lot of vulnerable people that Baptist Care work with, because we also have drop-in centres, people escaping domestic violence, we do all sorts of things. Um, and so there's a wide variety of vulnerable people out there that need to get this vaccine. And it's not always easy to do these things if you're homeless and, and situations like that. I think that we need our staff to be vaccinated. Um, and as I said, that's quite a difficult thing. And um, as we hire new staff, but we also need to think about, well, how far do we go? So at Baptist Care, we have a lot of people who work with residential aged care, but we also have people who work in head office, accountants and things that might only occasionally drop in to the aged care facilities. So should they be vaccinated? What's our role for forcing that um, in terms of, do we require it or do we um, 
say it's optional. We're working through things like that as I think many companies are. What about families and friends who visit the aged care facilities? Um, that's quite a difficult one to try and work out whether we mandate that or not. Um, and I think we need to follow all the different rules. We've got all of our requirements to care for our staff, the oh &S rules, but we've also got to have the ability for people to have uh, their own choice in certain circumstances. We need to have a look at what the government's going to mandate because we can't go outside what we're allowed to do legally as well. So there's a lot of those sorts of big issues that we need to work through. But for now, we know that the government has mandated for the, the care workers in the aged care facilities that they are, are required to have it. So that's our focus at the moment. But I just think it's the, the right thing to do to care for the um, vulnerable, that as much as possible, we have those who they interact with um, covered by vaccines. Yeah. Um, now, approaching it from a slightly different angle, because you are an actuary, um, what do you think of the, uh, the cost benefits, the numbers approach to the vaccination issue? Well, I think the government always has to use a bit of a cost benefit approach to these sorts of things. And you see it all the time. You see it when they're looking at whether we give mammograms for women of certain ages for free. Do we give bowel cancer scans only for those over 50? Um, and we know there's always people who fit outside that. My husband had bowel cancer for 46, so he didn't fit into where the cost benefit analysis said um, he should have been scanned. So, But it is a sensible way to do it because the government can't do everything. This one's a little bit interesting because I think that the probabilities have been changing a lot. The probabilities early on in Australia were really low, both um, for the vaccine side effects that we've heard a lot about and the probability of actually getting COVID. But I think that's changed quite a lot. But I think people have a fundamental difficulty in understanding such low probabilities. And we deal with it as actuaries a lot. We talk about the one in 200 earthquake and the one in 200 cyclone. And we think about those sorts of things in general insurance. And there's probably similar things in the other industries. But I think it's something that the general population have a lot of trouble with. So I've liked some of the perspectives that have been, I saw one in the Herald that talked about how many um, Sydney football stadiums that would take getting vaccinated for one person to die from the vaccine. And I thought, think that sort of thing helps put it in perspective. Um, but now that we've got the Delta strain out here, the probability of getting COVID is much, much higher than it was. We're no longer in that really protected situation. Um, although even in Australia now, that the probability is still so low compared to what it would be in the UK where my family are who've just been living with it for years. Um, well, for, it feels like years, but have just been living it in quite a different way. Um, so I think that that's led to a lot of confusion, but the probabilities are, so, uh, in my opinion, are so low for the vaccine. I certainly have gone out and had it and um, my kids are we finally got them appointments to get it, which is great. But I think that, that trying to balance that probability, the probability of passing it on to someone, which is actually what worries me more, is less about whether I was going to get it, but whether I would carry it to someone who was vulnerable, like my in-laws who are very, um, they wouldn't like it if I said they were elderly, but you know they're in their 80s and I would hate to think that I would have given it to them. So it's great to see how many people have actually stepped up to have the jab now that the the probability of getting it is so different compared to the probability of the um, back of the side effects from the vaccine. Well, thank you so much, Corinne, for um, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, well, I just want to draw everyone to the slider link again. If you have any questions that's popped up along the way, please put it up on there. Um, and now we're going to go to Sam before coming back to you later for the Q&A. Um, so Sam, Tell us um, about what you do, both as a medical doctor and a theologian. All right. Well, Charlie, yeah, thanks so much for having me here. So in case you haven't met me before, my name is Sam. And in case you're wondering, I was born in Hong Kong, but my parents moved to Australia when I was just a little baby. We spent two years in Darwin, six years in Adelaide. And then at the age of eight, I, we moved to Sydney. So I started off in Campbelltown, moved to Lumiere, moved to Minnow. So... I've always been a Western Suburbs boy, just moving one suburb at a time along the Western Suburbs train line. And then I lived the Asian dream. I, I, I got the marks to get into medicine. So I studied at Sydney Uni, did medicine there. And I worked full time as a medical doctor for about four years. These days, I still work part time as a medical doctor. 
but I also switched careers and I went into theology, which is a bit like philosophy and ethics all combined into one. So I'm sort of a person of the sciences and I'm a person of the humanities as well. I did a PhD in theology and I taught at a Bible college and I taught theology and ethics. So these days I work part-time with City Bible Forum, talking about faith, spirituality, and the Christian tradition. And also working one or two days a week doing elective surgery at Norwest Hospital, Westmead Private Hospital, and also uh, Lakeview Hospital. Wow, interesting. So what it's like in um, doing medical work these days in all those hospitals, what are the lessons and challenges that you guys have been learning along the way? Oh, we have learned so much. Like, we, one of the things was it actually caught even us doctors by surprise. I don't think early last year, I don't think any of us were really taking it that seriously. We were giving people bottles of Corona as a joke, toilet rolls as a joke. And now we realise how unfunny those jokes were because I, I think even we didn't realise how serious this virus was going to be. We underestimated the pandemic and I think that's the nature of pandemics. Peter Sandman, who's a risk communications expert says, you know, it's when your head and heart are out of sync. In a pandemic, your head usually under panics. It underreads how worried we should be. And your heart often overreads how worried we should be. So our hearts and heads are completely out of sync. Also as doctors, we have never been here before. So what usually makes someone an expert is they do something for the 10,000th time. This is the 10,000th time you've done an operation. But none of us have been in a pandemic before. Uh, the last one that hit Australia was probably the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. None, none of us were alive for that. So we're basically dealing with N equals zero like we have not been here before this is n equals one the first time we've had this case so none of us could ever say oh yeah the last time we had a pandemic we did this no no there has been no last time we're flying blind the other thing is most of us went into medicine because it was a safe profession it wasn't like firefighting it wasn't like being a, a policeman or criminal lawyer now we picked medicine because supposedly, this is why Asians pick it, because supposedly it's safe, you're not gonna get hurt and it's a secure income. And suddenly it was one of the most dangerous jobs. We were on the front line and we were having to wear goggles and PPE. It was just bizarre. It was like a science fiction movie. And also they, they, they just cut elective surgery last year. So suddenly our safe income disappeared overnight and we didn't know when we were, could resume surgery or have an income again. The other thing is they keep changing the rules every 24 hours. They know 24 hours are the same. So every day there's a new directive and suddenly you gotta wear goggles, now you gotta do this. And it's all, and we can understand where these rules come from, but they're very hard to implement because suddenly where are we gonna get goggles if we haven't had goggles? And, and if a patient, you know, we gotta treat a patient as if they're infected, we can't go in the room for another 15 minutes. And so it, 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 it's, it becomes almost unworkable and very impractical and very scary and very science fiction-like all at the same time. Wow, yeah, Hi. that sounds indeed very scary. Um, so as a doctor, what makes the COVID vaccine such a complex issue? I think, well, as a doctor, the vaccination should be such a simple thing. Hey, you know, we've had polio vaccines, we've had TB vaccines, we have hepatitis vaccine. This is one of many vaccines we already have. Like if you go to the emergency department with a cut, usually the doctor or nurse will ask you, when was your last tetanus shot? And you say, oh, I can't remember. They say, ah, oh, we'll just give you one anyway. Like there's no there's no paperwork, there's no informed consent. We just give you a tetanus shot, just like that. And, and But somehow this, so it, sh it should be a simple thing. But what this vaccination thing has shown is it has shown what, that none of us are really rational thinkers and we can't be rational thinkers because one, we don't have enough evidence. None of us have access to enough evidence. Also, it shows how at a bigger question, we're being forced to ask questions like, why should I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? And why do I believe what I believe? So in the end, why should I take a vaccination? And it's a very emotional thing. Like someone is injecting 
some unknown substance into your body. And at that moment, we have all these irrational fears. Also, why should I take a vaccine? We hear people saying it's my body, it's my right. Uh, if I get sick, then you know it's my choice. But we're also saying things, well, it's more than just your choice because this is an issue of not just individual rights, but collective responsibility. By taking a vaccine, it's not so much you're protecting yourself, you're protecting the community. But then you've got questions, well, why should I take one for the community? Who trumps who, the individual or the collective? And why do I believe what I believe? And suddenly we realise most of our beliefs are formed based on who we belong to. There's a lot of tribal psychology going on here. And who do I trust uh, for my beliefs? So most of us here, if a, if a doctor says you need an operation, we will say, oh, okay, but why should we trust the doctor? Like, like, why would the doctor know? And then some of them might say, oh, because the MRI scan says you need an operation. But then we could ask, well, how do I know the MRI scan is correct? And how do I even know how an MRI scan works? So suddenly we realize most of us are forced to form beliefs based on very limited information. We don't have comprehensive access to the truth. And I think that's why this vaccination thing has become so complicated because it's forced all of this upon so many people in such a short time. Right. Yeah. That's some very interesting thoughts. Um, and as a theologian, which is your other hat, uh, tell us about the different ethical models and how those can help us approach this issue. Yeah, that's right. So it's again forced to ask these bigger questions. Why should I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? And why do I believe what I believe? And in ethics, we have all these meta ethical theories. Like we could say, well, based on deontology, which is just a very big word from Immanuel Kant saying, well, because the rules say you should do that. And that's why we stop at red lights because the rules say you should do that. It's why we form rules in the home, like last one to shower must squidgy, Last one to use up the toilet paper must replace the toilet paper. But this by itself leads to a very narrow ethic because sometimes we do need to break the rules. Let's say the light's been red for 20 minutes. Suddenly we realise the traffic light's been broken. Only a fool would still stay at the red light. A wise person would break the rules. Uh, rules lead to unintended consequences. So last person to shower must squidgy the shower. Well, usually that means, well, I'm not going to bother showering then if that means I'm the last person or I'll make sure I leave one piece of toilet paper on the toilet roll. So at least there are unintended consequences. So then some people say, well, let's just look at consequences. What leads to good results? That's why we do what we do. But, you know, Lance Armstrong cheated, won seven Tour de France. That was a good result for him. The only problem was he got caught. But, you know, uh, what if he didn't get caught? And we've seen America withdraw from Afghanistan. That's been good for America, not very good for the people being left behind. So good for who? So you should take a vaccine because it's good. But yeah, but good for who? So that brings us to a third way of forming ethics. We call it the social contract ethics. Let's all agree on what's good. It's like backyard cricket or backyard handball. We agree on rules. But then the problem with this is which tribe gets to say the rules and now that we're more polarized than ever we can't agree on what these rules are and we also like to critique other societies when we tell japan they should not wail where we'll do any wailing that's us imposing our societal contract upon their societal contract so the fourth model is my favorite model it's called the virtue model instead of asking what i should do the question is well who should i be do I like the person that I have become? What is true? What is good? What is beautiful? Let me be that. But of course, if you're listening carefully, you realize, well, that's moved the goalpost just back one step further because what is true? What is good? What is beautiful? Like, who should I be? And that's where we realize we have what I call the Otto bin problem in ethics. Do I put the green bin out or do I put the yellow bin out? I can't remember which bin I should put out. That's why we need someone from the outside to tell us it's the yellow bin. And suddenly we realize we need something that transcends who I am, who my society is, to tell us what is true, good, and beautiful. What is a good rule? What is a good consequence? What is a good social contract? 
And what is good character? And I, I guess that's, what I, that's why I love the Christian tradition because the Christian tradition makes this big claim that says, well, the Logos, the Logos became flesh. And if you don't know what I mean by that, the Logos was the Greek organizing principle of the universe. And the big claim in the Bible was that the Logos, uh, Jesus became flesh to show us what is good, true, and beautiful. And based on that, we can work out, well, what is a good character? What is a good contract? What is a good rule? And what are good consequences? Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sam, for sharing those, uh, sharing the, those thoughts, both from, uh, uh, you know, a little view inside a hospital and some thoughts about uh, ethics and approach to what we should do. Um, so we are going to have a little intermission now where uh, Martin is going to conduct an interview with, uh, with Jordan Bailey. Um, about hope groups, so I'll pass it over to Martin. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, so, yep, yeah, my name is Martin Chung from City Bubble from the guy who's been pestering you with all the emails. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, so, I, I think, um, yeah, as Charlie mentioned, please start sending your questions to uh, Sam or Corinne using the Slido link uh, that has been shared in the chat room. And uh, while you gather your thoughts, uh, so we've got a bit of time. I think we're running well ahead of our sort of schedule. So you've got um, plenty of time to ask questions. And as you gather your thoughts, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce you to Jordan. Um, so um, Jordan is based in Melbourne and works for ANZ as the Scrum Master. Uh, that's his official job title, believe it or not. So, uh, hey, Jordan, um, thanks for joining us today. For, I guess, some of us who are not as familiar with the title Scrum Master, could you tell us a little bit about what exactly do you do? Are you the captain of the rugby team at ANZ? Or what exactly <laughs> do you mean by the Scrum Master? Thanks, Martin. Uh, and thanks for having me on uh, today. And, um, and Corinne and Sam, thank you very much for speaking to I, I got a lot from that. So thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a Scrum Master. Uh, what is that? So... Um, a lot of companies at the moment are choosing a new way of working uh, as opposed to this standard project management world where you have an end date and you have how much money you have for the project and you start working backwards and you've got to get everything done in a day. And it's a waterfall-like format. And this new way of working, which um, has been around for 20 years and probably a bit longer than that, but it's been popular for the last 20 years, is called Agile. Uh, and Agile is uh, continuous delivery of something. So if you are building wanting to build a car in a year, uh, what can we give to the market earlier um, to make sure that we're on the right track? Maybe we can give them a bicycle in a week or a month. Maybe we can make them a scooter uh, or a, um, uh, a moped. Um, and then it turns out that the customer doesn't want the car, they want a speedboat. And so that was great that we found that out earlier and we're able to create a speedboat. Um, whereas if we had have gone to the original project management world, uh, we would have built a car in a year without consulting the customer and it would have been the wrong thing. So that's the idea of Agile. Um, and there are some pretty um, popular disciplines around how we can release things to the customer earlier and get feedback earlier. Um, and one of them is called Scrum. And it has derived from rugby. The idea is that we swarm on something and something goes wrong. We swarm on it. Everyone stops what they're doing and fixes that thing and then goes back to their stations. Um, and so the idea of me being a scrum master is really just being an agile coach. Uh, so I'm coaching the teams. We don't have project managers. I'm, I'm coaching my teams to uh, work more efficiently, but also effectively. Um, are we doing the right thing? And are we doing the thing right? and um, helping them to inspect their work, adapt regularly, and then improve relentlessly. Um, and so we do that in two week cycles, every two weeks, we go, what, have, what value have we produced? Are we on the right track? What have we learned? How can we improve for the next sprint? And we do that over and over again. Um, looks like, um, sorry. sorry, sorry, Jordan. It looks like I, I was on the right track, uh, given that it's, uh, <laughs> it does drive from rugby. Hey, uh, hey, Jordan, you, um, I heard that um, you sort of attend this lunchtime meeting uh, called the Hope Group. Um, what exactly is this thing? And, and what is a Hope Group and what do you guys do when you actually catch up with other people? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, what's the reason I'm here? Um, we, we, we have a Christian organization at ANZ and, um, and we were discussing 
earlier this year what we can do for the company or what we can do for the non-Christians in the bank. And hope groups came up from someone from uh, that works at City Bible Forum, uh, David Chan. Um, and and we, we investigated into what this was. Uh, someone, I forgot the gentleman's name who created it from Tasmania, but basically it came out of COVID and it's how do we support people during COVID times, but also with a flavor of God in there. And that's basically what it is. So I, I went to my friend, my colleague and asked him if he wants to read about stories of hope from the life of Jesus. And, um, and I said, you know, we discuss what's been a challenge this week and uh, what are we grateful for this week and what are we going to do to help someone? And he really loved the idea of, of discussing what has been a challenge for him um, and what he is grateful for. So it's one of those, you know, gratefulness um, activities as well and how you can help someone. And, and I was, I was honest with him too. I said, it's, it's very Christian flavored uh, um, session. And, um, and he was interested to try it out. And we started off very um, conservatively. So we, we were heavy on the, what are you grateful for and and what's been a challenge and um, how would you like to provide hope to someone or help someone uh, this week forward? Uh, but also we read a passage from the Bible and it might've been the parable of the talents or um, it might've been the lost sheep could have been anything like that. And, and we just asked some questions. What is it saying about God? What is it saying about Jesus? What does it say to you? What does it say about people? And we just ask those questions. We read it twice. Mm. Uh, so one person reads it and another person reads it. It's a small group around three to four people. And, um, and it's been going, we've been doing it for about, I don't know, 14 weeks or so. And, and um, it's actually, he's starting to, to one of our, sorry, oh, last sentence, one of our um, hope groupies is starting to run it as well and, and starting to yep. ask for prayer requests, which is just awesome. I mean, it does sound like a quite a, you know, safe and, you know, a, a friendly place to sort of meet people and to think about, I guess, hope, which is a big word at the moment. Um, Because a lot of people are feeling hopeless um, for various reasons. Uh, But to be honest, uh, you know, let me be the devil's advocate here. But uh, we we're quite busy, right? (laughs) We've got a Zoom fatigue. Uh, This thing called work gets in the way. Uh, So Mm -hmm. why, if if somebody's sort of thinking about joining another thing on their agenda and joining lunchtime groups like groups, why would anyone bother committing extra time to meet uh, people in this way? Mm, good question. Firstly, it doesn't have to be lunchtime and you can, you, it doesn't have to be an hour. It can be 45 minutes. It can be 30 minutes if you cram it in. Um, why do it? Because one, it's a circuit breaker. You're not talking about work. And if you are, it, you know, you're venting about work or. You might be grateful about work, but you're not talking about the work with work colleagues uh, necessarily. So it's an opportunity and have events, relax, let their hair down, um, and also learn something about God. All right. Thanks so much, Jordan, for sharing your experience about Hope Group. So if you'd like to consider joining a Hope Group with people in our Fellowship Beyond Numbers Network, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, the link that I've just shared in the chat room is where you can sign up for Hope Groups that will kick off in September. Uh, so please sign up and I'll be in touch. Now, I think it's time for Q&A now. Uh, so I might pass it over to Charlie. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Jordan, for sharing about these very encouraging little groups called Hope Groups. Uh, so thank you. And also to everyone who's been putting questions into Slido. I'm just going to start from the top. Uh, Sam and Corinne, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, as if you feel like you've got some thoughts to share. So the first question... Uh, the government is faced with the balance of keeping the economy going and the balance and the health of people um, catching COVID mental illness. How, how do you think they're going? I'll quickly jump in. There's so many good questions, so little time, so much to say. It's so hard to say because every country has um, reacted differently, as in the virus has affected every country differently. So UK has had a different experience from Israel. Israel has a different experience from New York. New York is different from Florida. So there's no playbook where N equals zero. So it's very hard for the government to get it right. But really what the government has to do is flatten the curve long enough so that 
the hospital beds don't get overwhelmed. So we have enough ICU beds for the sick people uh, so that schools can reopen as soon as possible and so that we don't get mutants, uh, mutations, variants of the virus forming that will outpace the vaccination. So that is the juggling thing. And I think uh, to go to zero cases is a bit naive. Someone said it's like us trying to get back into our wedding dress from 20 years ago. Zero cases is no longer possible. It's how can we manage it in the same way we manage TB, polio, smallpox and other diseases. I think um, it's very hard, isn't it, for the government is what you're saying. And so for me, I think... Um, what I'm trying to do is not to critique them constantly because I think that I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I think there's they're never going to do a job perfectly and I'm just glad I'm not up there making the decisions. But I think it's important that as Christians particularly that we pray for them and we pray for wisdom for, the, for our leaders and for the doctors and for everyone who's making these decisions. I think that's the best thing we can do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I think I'll just quickly say, I think the funny thing is when we did medicine, Med school in the 80s, we, none of us paid attention during the infectious diseases classes, the epidemiology classes or the public health classes because we thought that's never going to bother us. Little did we know like this would be our world now. So we should have taken more notes and paid more attention. <laughs> yep. Um, so, guys, if there's lots of questions now, so please start voting for the questions if, uh, if you do see good ones. Um, I'll keep working down the list. Um, if this is one, of, if this vaccine is like the others, why has it attracted moral issues around its connection to cells of um, aborted babies? I'll quickly jump in. I think it's the fear of the unknown because really medically it is so much like all of the other vaccines. We've arrived at, at through different technology, but I think it's, it's um, just the fear of the unknown. So we latch at things. And so we create post hoc reasoning just to, to, to give us confirmation bias. But, you know, you know um, I think that's the reason. It's the fear of the unknown. It's come out at us way too quick, way too soon. And we haven't had a time for our reasons to catch up. So again, our hearts and heads are out of sync. But really, there are no more, there are no different moral issues over this vaccine versus the other vaccines. Um, vaccinated people can still catch and spread the virus, so why should we vaccinate? How do we reconcile this thought? I, again, very quickly, yes, but the, it's much lower rate of infection and much less severe symptoms. So whenever the press says, oh, this person died and they were vaccinated, yeah, but they were the one in 90,000. And, and it's, the, it's, it's like reporting on the shark attack and not reporting on the other hundreds of swimmers who didn't get attacked by a shark. And I think that's what, what's happening. Yes, you get vaccinated. Yes, you can still catch it. Yes, you may still pass it on. Yes, you may still have symptoms, but much less likely. Right. Um, okay, so next question. Um, uh, so this one's specifically addressed to you, Sam. Uh, Sam, you've talked about how ethics are formed conceptually. Uh, where do you think that the Christian ethic leads us with regards to vaccines? I think the biggest thing is how can I be loving to my neighbour? What would be the loving thing to do? I think the government and most of us have framed us as what is best for me so if I can get vaccinated, I can travel or life can go back to normal. No, that is the wrong way to frame it. The best way is what's the most loving thing I can do for my neighbour? And probably it is to get vaccinated because that means I will protect the vulnerable I won't pass on the, the I won't pass on infections uh, to, to the, the weakest members of our society mm -hmm. okay um, next question uh, maybe Corinne you're better placed to answer this but to do a risk um, assessment on getting vaccinated where do we find data on mortality and serious long-term consequences for COVID versus the vaccines um well, personally, I did a lot of um, internet searching, which is not always a good idea, but if you can try and find the reputable places like New South Wales Health do put out a lot of information about the vaccines um, by age groups and different things that you can look at. And I, I was looking at that in making the decision for my kids as well as to um, what those effects were. Sam might have some other suggestions, but I'm, you just, you've got to be wary. You can't just trust the, the media, obviously. You need to go to reputable sites. Yeah, and I think listening to Norman Swan, I, I love how he approaches it. He says, okay, these are new vaccines, but let's look at how 
vaccines in the past have behaved? Because everyone says, oh, what about long-term side effects? Well, the quick answer is, well, usually with most vaccines, if you're going to get a side effect, it's going to happen in the first week. Uh, so, so based on the behaviour of past vaccines, we can pretty much guess how these vaccines will behave. Uh, I think you also have to balance the long-term effects of if you get COVID, which there's a lot of evidence out there that that's actually got quite long-term effects too. It's not just a bit of a flu and get over it. Yep. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that are similar. Uh, so what advice do you have for how we can talk to our friends and colleagues, especially those who are sceptical? And kind of similar to that, there's a question about how would you share with fellow believers in Christ who oppose vaccinations? Um, even assuming its connection with the mark of the beast? I think the temptation as a doctor for me is to think, okay, if I just give them hard facts and data, that will make them change their mind. But what I really have to understand is people coming from a position of fear and vulnerability, and they're just really asking, who can I trust? And so if we can empathize and speak their fears back at them and just say, what are you afraid of? And just say, yes, I know, I totally get it. You know, someone's injecting something into my arm, I get it. Or, or just speak their fears back to them, empathize, and then just ask them, well, what would it make you, what, what, what would make you trust dot, 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 the vaccine or the doctors or the scientists? And in the end, most people form beliefs because they've seen someone they trust say or do something. So I think as more and more people that they trust, they see take the vaccine, they realise, hey, this is okay. So to, to give an example, a lot of my friends were very hesitant to take the vaccine, but then as they've seen more and more of their friends post pictures on social media getting the vaccine, suddenly they realise, hey, I trust these people. I, I, I too can get a vaccine. Uh, just for quickly for Christians, again, we don't want to overinterpret things like, you know, the mark of the beast. I, th I think those symbols are, are, are to show us, oh, you know, just patterns that happen throughout history, like the Roman Empire and other things like that. And in the end, just go back to things that we do know, which is how can I be a loving neighbour to the, those vulnerable people around me? Yeah, uh, one of the verses that I found quite helpful as well is in Philippians 2, where it says that we should value others above ourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And to me, that's saying I should be less worried about the impact on me and what the impact of me not having the vaccine is on those around me. And I found that personally quite helpful. Sure. And I'll quickly jump in there. That, that's so good. And I think what this whole vaccine thing has shown us and the whole polarization of society is once we remove something transcendent that we can hang on to, suddenly we have no common ground to share beliefs anymore. So how do we tell what, what how do we tell someone to take a vaccine when they say, well, in the end, I get to choose what's right for my body. And then if we can point them to a loving creator who's behind the universe, who's programmed into the very DNA of this universe that we are here to give and to serve and not worry so much about individual rights, but to give up those rights and serve and be loving to those around us. And as Kareem said, you know, the, the, the book of the Bible, the very fabric of the Bible points us to Jesus who gave up his rights to be God just so he could die for us, to give us his life. So it's in the fabric and the DNA of the universe because it's in the DNA of the creator to give up rights and to love and serve and do what's best for other people. Cool. Um, sorry for all the people that's asked more questions, but we're starting to run out of time. It's quarter past one. Um, so we will... Um, uh, I'm going to point you guys to the chat again because Martin is going to send out a feedback form. Um, so please, we would really appreciate it if you could fill that in. Um, and um, while you guys are doing that, let me just thank uh, our two speakers for today, Karina and Sam. Thank you guys so much for giving us your time and uh, giving us your thoughts on, on this topic. And I hope people have found it as interesting as I have. Um, it, it has been a challenging thought to consider. Uh, you know, our motivation behind uh, be, behind what we do and behind why we do what we do. Um, and please have a think about the hope groups that you heard about today. 
uh, see if that's the sort of thing you'll be interested in. If you'll find that uh, encouraging and helpful in in your weekly uh, in your weekly schedule. Uh, if you're if you're dropping off on behalf of the fellowship beyond numbers committee, hope you guys all have a wonderful Friday, a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you at the next event that we have. Thank you.